I'm going to re be reviewing a paper called Running Exercise Strengthens the Intervertebral Disc. Um, it's not as strong a proof as the other papers that I've looked at, but it does provide pretty strong proof of concept that it is possible to increase the torso height. Some authors have argued that IBT metabolism in humans is too small, slow to respond anabolically to exercise within the human lifespan. So what this means is that, you know, it's slow. But there is the possibility to, in to accelerate this with possibly HGH or IGF-1, but the problem is that this is that HGH or IGF-1 uh, costs money. But... On the other hand, there is a possibility that there's some form of novel exercise that we're just not seeing that could potentially have a benefit. Here we show that chronic running exercise in men and women is associated with better IBD composition, hydration and proteoglycan content, and with IBD helper hypertrophy. So the exciting thing about intervertebral disc hypertrophy is that it could put potentially lead to articular cartilage endochondral ossification which could potentially lead to increase in the, the bone size of the vertebra, which could lead to permanent torso height, but also increase in the IVD height could potentially lead to increase in torso height as well. So what they found is the accelerations at fast walking and slow running, but not high impact tasks, low intensity walking or static positions correlated to better positive IVD characteristics. So what this means is that is that the optimal loading for the intervertebral disc is biphasic. Too low or too high is not good. But what but the 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 troubling thing about that is that it also means that there's not a lot of potential to make this better with exercise. You sort of have to do the optimal loading and there's not much you can do. The only thing you could do is potentially accelerate is via supplements. But on the other hand, there is the possibility that there's a novel form of exercise that we're just not seeing. But still, you, you want your torso height to be as high as possible. So if there is a biphasic range, you want to be doing it, even though it may not have the best impact on your height. If it can increase height in any way, you want to be doing it. Um, loading types that are more likely to damage lumbar IVD tissue in humans such as flexion of the spine with compression, torsion, or to damage the vertebral imprint via axial compression with subsequent IVD degeneration. Okay, so I've talked about the benefits of torsion on the bone before. Um, but the thing to consider is that bone and cartilage are just different. Bone is easier to replace. Catabolism to bone is good because when you damage the bone, it's replaced with a more immature tissue type. If you damage the cartilage, it may be replaced with an inferior fibrous tissue fight type. Cartilage is harder to replace than bone. So you do not really want to cause catabolism to the cartilage because cartilage is hard to replace. Um, so yeah, so with limb lengthening surgery, um, when you, when you damage the bone, it's not really replaced with uh, a new growth plate, it, but the bone still heals. The bone still heals fine and still a more immature tissue type, but it still works. Um, whereas cartilage microfracture surgery does not really, um, repair the cartilage that well. Um, the tissue type is inferior. Bone is inferior, is harder, is easier to replace than cartilage. So catabolism to bone is good. We see that with limb lengthening surgery. We see that with all kinds of exercises. Likely anabolic window for the IBD exists. Dynamic loading of 0.2 to 0.8 MPA, generating intradiscal pressors of approximately 0.3 to 1.2 MPA at 0.1 to 1 hertz for approximately eight hours a day. So what this means is that there's a, you know, a likely anabolic window. So there's um, an optimal range to be loading the art in, in the vertebral disc and too high or too low um, is not going to have a benefit, but it also means that, would also mean that, you know, we're stuck at a certain point where this, this is all you can get from the IBD. This is the, the maximum 
low height we could get for the IV, IVD with current exercise. But again, there could be novel exercises. There could be potentially supplements like IGA, HGH or IGF-1 that could make this faster. But, you know, this is proof of concept and it's exciting. So they also mention here quadrupedal treadmill running exercises in rodents can have a positive impact on the rodent IVD. So there's other studies that can su support this. So here they recruited people with a minimum of five years history at their current physical activity level. Either no sport, 20 to 40 kilometers per week running, or five kilometer per week running, long distance runners. So what's, what's challenging about this is that it's not a longitudinal study. So ideally we'd wanna see changes in the IVD over time and see, study directly the impact of of exercise on the inverted vertebral disc. But the fact that there's other studies that support this and animal studies that are longitudinal makes this exciting. But again, we wanna see um, a longitudinal study in, in humans studying the best forms of exercise. And it, again, this is, this is only running. So running is basically axial impacts. It could be lateral impact is superior and actually has um, a greater impact. So even though, you know, it sucks that it's, this is biphasic and which means that, you know, there's an, there's an optimal loading window and you can only do that and you can't really accelerate it. But again, they're only studying axial impact. So there could be other forms of loading that are better, a lateral impact, um, you know. So, but we want to, we'd want to see more studies, but this is exciting because it's proof of concept. It's proof that it's impossible to increase your torso height which I think is very exciting, even though the fact that it's biphasic is, is disappointing. But th this, 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 um, this chart is, is which is a smoking gun. So you see here, the IVD height in the running group is higher. And that's very, very exciting because this is kind of a smoking gun that it's impossible to increase torso height. So this is why so on this channel, I'm trying to only accelerate, um, to only highlight papers that are smoking guns. I want to show that there is scientific literature that shows that height increase is possible. And this, this is a, a smoking gun to me, that the, the, the IVD height is, is greater. But what's um, interesting is that the height in the long distance running group is lower. Um, you know, so one of the things about this not being a longitudinal study study is that it could all be selection bias. Um, maybe people with certain anthropological characteristics are more likely to be long distance runners, which we can eliminate by doing longitudinal studies. So anthropomorphically, what we'd expect with this characteristics that IV dehydrate is greater is that long distance runners, runner groups would have higher torso height and l lower re relative leg length. Um, yeah, but we'd also expect this to see, to see this change over time. So people who, what we'd expect is um, over time for people in, who are long distance runners to have higher sitting height relative to overall height. If, if, um, long distance running did in, indeed increase torso height. What we'd expect is for over time, long distance runners would gradually have a greater sitting height to overall height ratio the longer they've been long distance running. But what's interesting here is that the runner group had higher height rather relative to the no sport group, which is exciting. And they also had IBD height. So I do not see how um, the running group could decrease height, um, you know. So the legs only have really two or so cartilaginous regions that contribute to height, whereas the spine has several. Um, the cartilage is a much greater contributor to overall height in the torso than the legs. So that's why certain people have greater torso height than lower body height. So if you ink, if you're stimulating the cartilage, it only stimulates height in two places in the leg, the, the knee joint and the ankle. 
whereas there are several intervertebral discs in the spine. But I do not see how long distance running could reduce overall body height in the legs. Because again, if you're catabolic to the legs, that's going to be beneficial to the bone. Um, you're stimul by breaking the bone, you're actually stimulating the bone. Whereas if you're breaking the cartilage, that's bad for the cartilage. So I do not see how this could um, lower overall body height because runners typically have good posture, so I don't see how it could be posture. Um, it could be that maybe even though IVD height is increasing, maybe other cartilage cartilaginous regions are decreasing in height. Um, but we can't really tell by the study. Um, so yeah, so this, this study really raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, but you know, there's still lots, a lot more answers to do. It's still a lot of, it's still a big proof of concept and, um, yeah, it's still very, a very exciting paper just, just for this number and not loan. And I think, um, this should be, if anyone says, oh, height increase is not possible, you should, this is, should be one of the paper that the columns that you show them. Yeah, yes, it is. This, this, this shows that it is right here, right here. And it's pretty, pretty direct, the IVD height. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't measure everything, all the, this, this, this does not measure all the contributors of height. So maybe other height parameters, um, decrease. Um, so they don't measure everything here. So a lot of the other, the IVD average area is about the same in the long distance via the moderate running and the, the long distance runner group. So that, that's very interesting that you, you see these all other columns be the same, but only the height increases in the long distance runner group. So you see that the, this is actually greater. The IVD average, the area of the IVD is actually greater in the moderate distance running group than the long distance running group, but the height is greater. So we wonder why that is, but I don't, I don't, I don't know why, why that is. Um, it's an interesting question and we want to do more studies to see why that is. So that here they look at the, the various muscle sizes. Um, I don't think we can, we can draw a lot of conclusions by that. Um, the, it provides interesting questions and we want to do some more studies. So here they mention a, a monozygotic twins. IBDs were were marginally, but not significantly larger in, in those twins that were at least eight kilograms heavier than their twin pair and presumably experienced greater habi habitual spinal loading. So this 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 statement right here indicates that it's it's not likely to be selection bias that um, that the long distance runners had greater IVD height. Um, since monozygotic twins have the, about the same genetics, it's likely to be the loading itself, itself that, that caused the change. Um, so here they say tissue ad adaptation will occur in the IVD with exercise, which is a very exciting statement, but we have to find, okay, what's the optimal exercise to increase the tissue adaptation? Um, if it's biphasic, that means that there's an optimal range and there's not much we can do, but that means we want to focus more on supplements. But the challenge with supplements is that they cost money. So that's not very exciting. But, but so what we would ha have to do is focus more on other loading mechanisms. So again, here they em emphasize the biphasic nature of the loading regime. Walking or slow running, fell inside this range or slow walking, fell below this range, fast running or high impact jumping activities were above this range. So again, they say that the loading regime is biphasic. There's an optimal range in which you want to be st stimulating the intervertebral discs. High impact loading is considered to be detrimental to the IVD and vertebral implant. Um, so what this means here is that since legs have more bone, and the bone is a greater, the greater contributor to the height in the legs. Um, it's okay to be catabolic to the legs because if you, if you, since the bone is the greatest impact to height in the legs, if you increase height in the bone by 1%, but decrease heart in the cartilage regions by 0.5%, you're going to get greater height. 
because even though you're bad for the cartilage, you're good for the bone, and bone is a greater impact on height in the legs. Whereas with the torso, the cartilage is a much, much greater impact on your height. So if you, if you, if you increase height in the bone by 1%, but decrease height in the cartilage by 2%, you're not gonna be increasing very much overall body height. Since cartilage is a much greater impact on the height in the torso than the legs. Again, all right. Similar muscle size in all groups, and this indicates that muscle adaptation per se is not the likely cause of difference in the IBD characteristics in our population. So this possibly means that it is not just passive diffusion that could lead to the change. So passive diffusion is basically nutrient uptake. So it could mean that maybe the, the actual impact just increases nutrient uptake of the inner vertebrates and that's what's causing the hydrotropy, which would not be very exciting because it would indicate that there's not much we can do. We just we could just maximize the the nutrient uptake, and that's all we could do to increase height. But if you're actually changing the cells and changing the cellular competition, and maybe inducing hypertrophy in some direct cellular way, that means that, that we could have a much greater profound impact on height. Um, here's some other things. Um, IBD height relative to vert vertebral body height. So it, so this is exciting because it means that, you know, it's actually changing the, the, the composition of the body. Greater T2 times indicate better IV dehydration and glyco seminoglycan semino content. Okay, so yeah, in conclusion, um, you know, this paper has a lot of interesting questions, um, but the key here is this proof. So this is with a lot of papers. We, we get a lot of questions. Um, we get a lot of intriguing facts, but we still need more papers to study. But, you know, we have proof of concept. This, this figure right here says that increasing torso height is possible, which is a very exciting to me, even though this paper does not provide all the answers. So, yeah, let's keep going.